So my name is Cornell Clayton. I'm the director of the Thomas S. Foley Institute here at WSU. And on behalf of the Institute, I want to welcome you out to our event uh, this evening. Um, and let me just make one, uh, uh, two preliminary announcements. One is if you're here for a class by chance, there will be uh, the opportunity after the event, at the end of the event, to uh, swipe your card or to sign up. And then secondly, also, I'm going to encourage you on your way out to fill out a survey that some local researchers are doing about the efficacy of uh, outreach programs and adult education here on the Palouse. And uh, the survey takes about eight minutes, but there's multiple ways you can take it. You can do it here, you can do it online, and there'll be a table out there, and they'll give you information about that. So I encourage you to do that so uh, people you know, on the Palouse know about whether these types of programs are effective or not. So uh, now let me introduce our event. There's probably no topic that is more important um, in, in lots of ways, not just in terms of partisan politics, but in terms of our real lives, than uh, addressing the problems of climate change. And this is one of those issues that has strangely become deeply uh, polarized along partisan lines. And you see this in opinion poll data on whether or not people believe there's man-made causes to climate change or not deep partisan divisions on that. And so uh, it's important that we can have these kinds of uh, cross-partisan discussions of this issue. And we're very fortunate to have with us today uh, two real leading experts on this, and as well as two former members of the US uh, Congress. So let me, uh, I'm gonna introduce both members, uh, after which they will speak uh, for you know, 15, 20 minutes apiece, and then we're gonna open it up for Q&A after that. So our first speaker will be Brian Baird, who served six terms in the U.S. House of Representatives representing Washington's 3rd Congressional District from 1999 to 2011. In Congress, Brian was known for promoting congressional integrity, working across the aisle, taking principled stands on difficult issues, and for his leadership on ocean acidification, science, and fiscal responsibility. Prior to serving in Congress, Brian chaired the Department of Psychology at Pacific Lutheran University. He published numerous scholarly articles and books and was a practicing neuropsychologist for more than two decades. In 2017, Brian co-founded Washington Independence, a group that aims to reform our political system by electing independents to office in the state of Washington. He is also the founder and president of 4Peer2 Communication, a consulting firm focusing on public policy and science communication. After Brian speaks, he will be followed by Bob Inglis. Bob served in Congress representing the uh, Greenville-Spartanburg area, area of South Carolina from 1993 to 1998 and again from 2004 to 2010. He graduated with a BA from Duke University and a law degree from the University of Virginia School of Law. Prior to his election to Congress, Bob practiced commercial real estate law in Greenville, South Carolina. In 2012, Bob launched the Energy and Enterprise Initiative at George Mason University and he currently serves as its executive director. The initiative promotes free enterprise action on climate change. Bob was a resident fellow at Harvard University's Institute of Politics in 2011, a visiting fellow at Duke University's Nichols School of the Environment in 2012, and a resident fellow at the University of Chicago's Institute of Politics in 2014. For his work on climate change, Bob was given the 2015 John F. Kennedy Profile and Courage Award. He has also appeared in the acclaimed documentary Merchants of Doubt and in the Showtime series Years of Living Dangerously. So join me now in welcoming Brian Baird. Thank you for the kind introduction and for your leadership of the Foley Institute. It's such a pleasure to be with you all. Uh, I had the great honor of representing the third congressional district of our state, which is all of southwest Washington, so Olympia down to Vancouver, uh, east up the Columbia Gorge and out to the coast. So I had the opportunity to represent WSU Vancouver and was very, very proud of that, especially in the early days. It was, it was just getting started up. And I think uh, the Foley Institute is such a great venue for this and, and such a great sponsor because Tom Foley is, is widely respected by both sides of the aisle. Uh, he, he was a gentleman statesman, someone we, we honored, who took the job extremely seriously, who put country over self and and principal over party, and who was able to work with both sides of the aisle. And he's deeply missed, and I was privileged not to, yet to serve with him, 
because he uh, left before I got there. But I considered him a role model and a mentor, and he, he was just a great member of Congress in, in sort of the old school days, in, in the very best sense of old school. Uh, I'm also so excited to be here with my friend Bob Inglis. I, I uh, served 12 years in the U.S. House, again from southwest Washington, and Bob and I both had the great opportunity to serve on the House Energy and Environment Subcommittee of the House Science Committee. So this was a committee that had jurisdiction over most of the federal research relating to climate change. And in that capacity, when Bob's party was in the majority, Bob was the chair of the committee and I was the ranking Democrat on the committee for several years. And Bob always treated me with the utmost courtesy and respect and friendship. And I hope Bob would say I did the same. Often in Congress, when you hear somebody say, as my dear friend from the other side says, <laughs> you know that's not quite what they mean. But the backstory is uh, Bob and I traveled to war zones together. We went to Iraq and Afghanistan, other parts of the Middle East. We uh, traveled on climate change issues. His son secretly worked in my office. I say secretly because if Bob's district had known, there would have been an ad. And Bob Inglis' son works for a Democrat. <laughs> so, Bob kept that like top secret. <laughs> and, but Bob, Robert, his son, is a great kid and uh, had in medical school now, said to be an ER doc. So Bob and I are, are sincerely good friends. He stayed at my house last night and we've done a lot together. And so he's one of the folks I most admire in the Congress. Part of what I admire about Bob is, uh, and what you'll hear today, is it is easy to do what's easy. <laughs> that sounds like a tautology, but it's not easy to do what's hard, especially when your career may be at stake. Bob will tell you his own personal story, but here's a gentleman from a very, very conservative uh, Republican district in South Carolina, lifetime conservative average that he'll talk to you about, and he became persuaded that the evidence for climate change was real. Now the easy thing, and we both know colleagues who don't believe that's the case, or who believe the evidence is compelling, but they're scared to death to say it because they might lose their job. Now think about that. The fate of the planet is at stake, but you're worried about your job. Are you that unemployable? I mean, are you, are you, you so afraid that if you take a position based on sound science that you can't get employed again? But not only that, he proposed a solution. And in my judgment in Congress, if you're not willing to lose your job, you are not fit to keep it. I Meaning if you're not willing to take a principled stand, maybe it's wrong, but you should, if you think it's the right thing to do and you think the evidence is compelling to do that, then you ought to do it. And Bob and I traveled around the world together. We went to some very interesting places, met the top scientists in the world. And Bob said, it's compelling. He did this before, I don't take any credit for it. And then we worked together on a host of things. In 2000, what, 2007 that we put forward cap and trade? Was it, two, uh, not you and I, but the party? Uh, oh nine. Was it oh nine that late? So when the Democrats recaptured the House, the majority of Democrats believe the evidence on climate change is real, and they put forward a 1,500-page, incredibly complicated cap-and-trade bill with good intentions, but it passed the House but didn't go anywhere in the Senate. A lot of people lost their, their positions over it. In contrast to the 1,500-page bill that the Democrats put forward, Bob put forward a 15-page bill for a revenue-neutral cap and trade or a carbon tax that he'll talk to you at length about. And to do that, when the majority of your party was saying, this isn't real, it's a hoax, it's a conspiracy, took immense courage. And Bob lost his seat because of it. But he's continued to travel the country talking to people about the positive message about how climate change is real, but that doesn't have to be seen as a dire threat. It's an opportunity for America to lead again. It's an opportunity for our best technology, our best scientists, our best students, our universities, our free enterprise system to rise up to take the challenge and make a difference in this truly existential threat for the world. And the last thing I'll say about Bob, and I'll talk a little bit later about some of what I've done, but it, Bob doesn't just go where it's easy. It would be pretty easy for somebody who believes in climate change to go to the Evergreen State College in Olympia, Washington. Not a hard sell, right? Bob goes to places where people have a, a tradition, possibly, of skepticism, where it's not necessarily easy. And Bob is able to communicate people in a way that is respectful, that is compelling, and whether their motivations or interests are a, a, a deep faith perspective, 
from, the, from Christian or other faith traditions, whether it's a conservative free enterprise position, Bob is able to speak to those folks and very importantly listen to them and convey ideas and insights that might be lost otherwise. And I think it's that kind of interaction that we've lost, frankly, increasingly in our politics today, a willingness to respectfully listen to the other side and that Bob uh, embodies not just in rhetoric, but in how he spends his life and the organization he's created. So please join me in welcoming my dear friend, sincerely my dear friend, uh, <laughs> Bob Inglis to the great state of Washington and to the great Cougar. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks, Brian. Yes, indeed, we are friends. And it's like, uh, you know, uh, although it's dangerous, when we were being introduced as uh, members of Congress, I'm reminded of what Pat Schroeder used to say. She was a member of Congress from Colorado. She used to say, don't tell my mother I'm a member of Congress. She thinks I'm a prostitute. <laughs> uh, so uh, <laughs> it might be like a little bit better than being a member of Congress, maybe. But anyway, so uh, here we are, two of those, former. <laughs> Whatever we are. <laughs> anyway, um, and Brian says that uh, all those nice things about me, but I can tell you I'm his student. You know, he's taught me about uh, ocean acidification, and uh, he taught me a whole bunch about social science research. I remember quite often on science committee just uh, really being educated by what uh, people like Brian knew. And so, uh, and uh, he's a great host here in the state of Washington. So I'm going to get going here tonight, uh, this afternoon. And you're going to think that maybe I'm an economist. Uh, I'm not. Um, I'm going to get going. You're going to think I'm a scientist. I'm not one of those either. And I might get going so excitedly that you think I've got this, that I think I've got the solution to every problem in the world. I don't. Uh, but what I will describe for you is the, the, the best idea I came across while I was in Congress. And that's what I'm here to talk about. Um, now, if you're a conservative here, you're maybe a little bit nervous because you're thinking, oh my gosh, it's a climate, it's a climate conversation. He's probably going to tell us we're all going to die. Um, next Tuesday or something, um, and there's a great panic, and we must all rush out right now and turn off the heat and uh, turn off all the lights and sh shiver or sweat in the dark, depending on the season, right? Or, and you're going to be thinking that it's also, you're, maybe if you're conservative here, you're thinking, well, if China and India aren't in on this deal, it's not worth doing. You may be thinking about things you've heard about, maybe... Maybe it's sunspots, or maybe it's other stuff, or you're thinking, how am I going to go to Thanksgiving dinner and fit in with my people if I go there to say that climate change is real and I'm a conservative? So if you're a conservative here, relax, because you're going to hear tonight something that you can say at Thanksgiving dinner and not get kicked out of the tribe. Um, and um, you're also going to hear that it's not about uh, some kind of uh, um, uh, apocalypse that's upon us, but rather it's reasonable risk avoidance. So you can relax if you're a conservative. If you're a progressive here tonight um, and you hear what I'm saying, you might get a little bit nervous because you're thinking, geez, high octane conservative, isn't he? He's talking a real free enterprise, and he's got such a faith in free enterprise. Well, hang with me if you're progressive, because by the end, I will tell you something that might make you feel more comfortable. So whether you're a conservative or progressive, you're most welcome to the conversation. We're looking forward to your questions and your comments. Um, but first, let me, uh, I guess I need to do two, uh, several things here tonight. One is uh, I, I, I want to tell you a little bit about how I've come to this so that you know, have a little bit of background about why in the world is this guy from South Carolina here talking? Well, in part because Rick Littlejohn over here is a South Carolinian who invites me out here. So uh, it's part that, but it's also that, uh, like I say, this is the best idea I came across while I was in Congress. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself, um, and then I'm going to tell you about this idea. Okay, and then we'll get to your, we'll get to some more thoughts from Brian, and we're going to get to your questions and comments. So, uh, for my first six years in Congress, I said that climate change was nonsense. I didn't know anything about it, except that Al Gore was for it. 
Uh, and that was the end of the inquiry. Uh, Rick can testify if you represent Spartanburg and Greenfield, South Carolina, the US Congress. That's the right answer if you're a, uh, planning on being reelected. Uh, so that's my first six years in Congress. Um, I admit that's fairly ignorant, OK? Um, but that's the way it was for my first six years. Then I was out of Congress for six years doing commercial real estate law in Greenville, South Carolina, again, and um, running for Congress in 2004. Same district, same seat. Um, it had been occupied by Jim DeMent, and then he was running for the Senate, and so the seat was open, and I was running for the same seat again. So my son came to me, the eldest of our five children, the one that ended up working for Brian Baird. Can't Brian, if you want to do attack ads, Brian Baird would be the voice talent you want. <laughs> I mean, an incredible voice that he can do those attack ads. Uh, I think he really moonlights and does that, if you want to know the truth. That's what Brian does. And anyway, so uh, uh, my son came to me, just turned 18. He's voting for the first time in 2004. So he said, Dad, I'll vote for you but you're gonna clean up your act on the environment. It's the first of a three-step metamorphosis for me. Um, by the way, he's gonna vote for me no matter what, right? It wasn't in his economic interest to vote against me. I mean, <laughs> uh, he knew that we were mortgaging the farmette that we live on. Uh, farmettes when you're not making a living farming, you just pretend to be farmers, you know, so we've got, uh, I think, 17 chickens at the moment and four horses and a big garden, and we just pretend to be farmers, right? And so uh, but Robert knew we were mortgaging the farmette, to run for Congress. So he was going to vote for me no matter what. What he was saying was, Dad, I love you. And you could be better than you were before. So how about be relevant to my future and your four daughters' future? And let's get with it in this second go around and make it English 2.0, the new and improved version. So um, a second step in the metamorphosis for me was going for my first time to Antarctica in 2006 with Sherry Bollert chairman of the science committee and seeing the evidence in the ice core drillings. If I go too far into that, I'll start sounding like the scientist that I'm not. And then I'll call on Tara to be the scientist that she is, or somebody here to uh, answer that question. But um, so I saw that evidence. Um, briefly, it's this. In the ice cores um, that we pull up out of the long gone ice there, uh, or the long frozen ice, we have a record of the Earth's atmosphere. Fun fact to know and tell, the South Pole is a desert. It gets a quarter of an inch of precipitation a year. They describe their ski conditions as a mile of ice and a couple inches of powder. Because <laughs> um, it's basically 5,000 feet of dirt and then 5,000 feet of ice and a couple inches of powder. And in the 5,000 feet of ice, there's an amazing record of the Earth's atmosphere. And what it shows is stability and then this uptick in CO2 levels coinciding with the Industrial Revolution. And I'm not a scientist, and I'm not, even, I'm not a trial lawyer, I'm a commercial real estate lawyer, but you can see that that just makes sense, right? I mean, if I'm burning trees in my fireplace this winter, well, that tree's just falling dead on my property, in my farmette. I chop it up, I put it in the fireplace. I'm accelerating the process by a little bit, but it's no big deal. But if I go deep in the earth and pull up trees long gone under time and temperature and pressure turned into fossil fuels, petroleum, natural gas, coal, bring them to the surface, burn them. I'm changing the chemistry of the air. I like to say at this point, don't object. Because if you do, you'll get an F in chemistry, right? Uh, because that's just a chemical equation. And it's, got to have a, it's got an equal sign and it's got a balance, OK? So don't object there. I'll tell you where you can object if you want to object. Um, then the physics of light are such that light enters, but all the heat generated from that light striking the Earth doesn't all back, go back into space. Don't object there, you'll get an F in physics, um, because that's been known since the 1800s. Not new science. Here's where you can object. The models of all of that are complicated. And you can challenge some of the assumptions. And the question is whether they're going to be precise enough to, to predict that the storm is coming to my house or your house. So like Hurricane Irma, you know, in the last 24 hours, that storm shifted 45 miles west and hit Naples rather than hitting Miami. That's with eyes on the storm, using modeling techniques, we were off by 45 miles. So you can challenge these models um, and the complexity therein, uh, but you, 
really don't want to doubt the basics of the chemistry and the physics. And so uh, basically what they show is there's a storm coming. Whether it's going to hit my house or your house and when it exactly is going to hit, that's harder to predict. So that's what I learned in Antarctica, right? Um, and then there was a second trip to Antarctica that forms my third step in my metamorphosis that Brian led in 2008. And um, we were at a stopover at the Great Barrier Reef looking at coral bleaching. There's a symbiotic, this is where I'm going to sound like a scientist again. Uh, there's a symbiotic relationship between coral and an algae. Increase the water temperature by one degree C, and the coral kicks out the algae, and they both die. It's sort of like it's too hot in bed for the two of them. So the coral kicks out the algae, and they die, both of them. So uh, this Aussie climate scientist is showing us this, but really showing us the glories of the reef. And I could tell that he and I shared a world view before any words were spoken. Because I could see that he was worshiping God and what he was showing me. You know, St. Francis of Assisi said, preach the gospel at all times. If necessary, use words. So Scott was preaching the gospel. I could see it in his eyes. I could hear it in his voice. I could see that he was worshiping God and what he was showing me. So later we had a chance to talk, and he told me about conservation changes that he was making in his life in order to love God and love people. Um, Scott does some things that my conservative friends might find a little bit silly. He rides his bike to work, tries to do without air conditioning in Townsville, Australia, as long as his wife and three daughters will let him do it. Um, he tries to do without the electric dryer, all in order to consciously love people coming after us. Uh, so I decided I want to be like Scott, loving God and loving people. So I came home and introduced the Raise Wages Cut Carbon Act of 2009. Note to self, do not introduce carbon tax in midst of reddest district of reddest state and nation in the midst of the Great Recession. It will not go well for you. And it did not go well at all. After 12 years in office in a Republican runoff, I got 29% of the vote, and the other guy got 71% of the vote. That, my friends, is a spectacular face plant and uh, one that you don't quite recover from. But at that point, a foundation came along and said to me, you know, Inglis, you are an unusual zoo animal, an actual conservative, 93 American Conservative Union rating, 100% Christian Coalition, 100% National Right to Life, A with the NRA, zero with the Americans for Democratic Action, that's a liberal group, and 23, by some mistake, with the AFL, CIO, the labor union, has really gone in for a zero. Um, and so um, uh, an actual conservative English, we use speak and write for the proposition. And so basically I said, if the cage is nice and the food is good, and the cage is very nice because I'm in beautiful places like this, and uh, I think the food's going to be good later, Rick. And uh, so um, uh, this, is, uh, this is all right to be the zoo animal. But I'm not the only one. That's the thing that I want to pass on to you right here and now, is that if you're that conservative who's hearing this and hearing my journey here toward getting involved in the climate space, I want you to know that it's quite different now than it was in 2009 when I introduced that bill. 2009, we're talking the darkest days of the Great Recession. Um, we're talking... Um, uh, less experience with climate change. Now, these years later, in 2018, people have had experience with climate change. Harvey has happened. Florence has happened. Um, we've had uh, Michael go to a category four or five and then down to four within like four days um, and hit Florida and then come up through the Carolinas, okay? So we've had the wildfires, we've had the, the experiences we're having with climate change. And then the other difference is, when I introduced that bill, it was remarkable how quickly the Heritage Foundation had done a study, a comprehensive study of my bill. I think it was 48 hours. Um, they had come back with a detailed economic analysis of my bill, indicating that it would destroy American civilization if it were ever passed. Um, now then, that was, at that point, the, there were only those groups that were out there 
Now it's us at republician.org, and you've got one of our coasters in your hand. Um, it's the Niskanen Center, it's R Street Institute, it's ClearPath Foundation, it's the Alliance for Market Solutions, it's CRESS, Citizens for Responsible Energy Solutions. I could go on naming these groups that are growing as the eco-right, we call it. It's a balance to the environmental left. The environmental left has this enormous left wing in this country. Hundreds of millions of dollars spent over here teeny bit of money spent over here on this hummingbird wing called the eco-right. So we're trying to grow this right um, so that the bird can fly straight in the country, basically, is what we're doing. That's our job at republican.org. So I told you how I've come to it. Now let me just describe briefly the policy that we're about. Um, there are some things we can do immediately. So for example, one is to spend some more money. Now, this is unusual, isn't it, for here a Republican with those ratings you served. Spend some more money on R&D on the things that could really be the breakthroughs. And so Brian uh, was key to ARPA-E, this um, program of uh, sort of modeled after DARPA, which is the defense agency that gave us the internet and the PC, essentially. Um, and then Judge Green busted up AT&T, and that gave us cell phones, basically. And so ARPA-E is this attempt to do the same thing for energy. And so surely something that Republicans, and make me make some of my libertarian friends a little bit uneasy to have government spending on this. But if you're a Republican like me, it's OK to have the government spending money on basic research that gets us to the technologies that might give the population hope that there's something we can do about this. The better battery, the better solar cell, um, uh, the ability to capture um, uh, and store CO2 and then uh, cap carbon capture and sequestration, and perhaps a direct air capture. If those things can be researched and developed, then all we need is this next thing which is a policy that would make them more economic. And we believe that if you get actual conservatives together and you start talking about, now how would we solve this thing? If we wanted to solve it, how would we solve climate change? And we think that within about 10 minutes, if you're talking to actual conservatives, not populist nationalists, they would be harder sell because they're into a doctrine of grievance and there's some other that's causing their problem, and unless you're going to finger that other and talk to them about it, you're not going very far with the populist nationalists. But if you're talking to actual conservatives, people who really believe in the power of free enterprise, we believe that in about 10 minutes, they'll come to the solution that all you got to do is internalize the negative externalities. I told you I'd start sounding like an economist at times, right? I'm not an economist. I'm not a scientist. But doesn't it make sense to just put all the cost in on all the fuels and eliminate all the subsidies? So we message pretty high octane, trying to move the center point of this conversation a little bit to the right. We and our colleagues on the eco-right try to push the conversation a little bit to the right to expand the space of people that can enter the conversation. And so we say to the Tea Party, not sure that we're going to get many votes over there, but we say, no more electric car credits. Right. No more production tax credit for wind. Right. No more investment tax credit for solar. Right, they say. Then we get a little bit more dicey. No more under market leases on public land for the extraction of minerals. You've got to pay market rates. Right. <laughs> <laughs> then we get to the hardest one. No more of the biggest subsidy of them all, which is being able to belch and burn into the trash dump of the sky without paying any of the damages you're causing there. That's the biggest subsidy of them all. Dwarfs those others I was just talking about. So, so far that's crickets, right, coming from that across the Tea Party fence. But we believe that if you have actual conservatives, they will listen to Milton Friedman, who once on the Phil Donahue show, asked by Phil Donahue, 
uh, some of you are too young to remember who Phil was, but he was a white guy doing an Oprah show, basically, if you need to know who he was. Um, so Phil asked him, what do you do about pollution then, Dr. Friedman, if you don't want to regulate it? And Friedman says, well, you tax it, of course. You tax pollution. And by taxing it, you attach that effect that it has, that negative effect it has, and you put it on the price of the products. And Friedman, a real believer in free markets and free enterprise, says that at that point, in the liberty of enlightened self-interest, consumers choose their self-interest, and they punish the products that have been externalizing those negative, the negative effects. Because now those are shown on their price. And somebody across town takes them out. The competitor that doesn't have those effects takes them out. And it's a creative destructionism of the free enterprise system. And that, among conservatives, gets us going. We're excited about that creative destructionism. So if I'm, so that's the idea that I came across when I was in Congress. And here's where I'm, I'm probably talking so much free enterprise, faith in free enterprise, it's, I've got some conservatives here ready to give me an amen and pass the plate, we'll pass it, and you know, we'll have, to have you sign up. Um, and I'm making some progressives a little bit nervous because you're thinking, I'm not sure I share his faith in free enterprise. Well, to those progressives, let me give you two things and then I'm going to stop and Brian's going to come back. Is one, let me give an example of how free enterprise worked. When DARPA, as I said, created the internet and the PC and basically handed over commercialization to a guy named Jobs and a guy named Gates, one of them decided to do price, the other one decided to make it really stylish. Um, they drove down costs of those things. And now you've got probably a phone in your pocket, right? Well, my first bag phone, I had a bag phone in 1992 when Rick was helping me in Spartanburg, uh, is a, a phone in a bag. I don't know, you might have seen one in a museum. You, you picked it up, it is in a cradle, it had a cord on it, and you talked on it. Well, there's count, three counties in the district, it only worked in two of them. It was about a dollar a minute, the battery didn't last, and it's probably why when McKinsey was asked by AT&T in the 1980s, mid-80s, to predict for AT&T, a company that was considering going whole hog into wireless uh, telecommunications, predict for us, McKinsey, how many cell phones will be in service at the year Y2K? So McKenzie thought and thought and came back with the answer, 800,000. The only problem for McKenzie was there were 800,000 cell phones going into service every three days as Y2K came around. So McKenzie had missed it by a lot. <laughs> that's the power of free enterprise. And I'm here to tell you that's what's going to happen in energy. When we free energy from this system we've got, and we move toward distributed energy systems, we're going to be powering our lives from our roofs and our cars from that roof and batteries stored in the garage. We're going to say to the Middle East, see if you can drink that stuff. And we're going to be a much healthier and happier country and a better planet because of the innovation that's going to come out of that free enterprise system. So, the last thing I'll tell you by way of uh, reassuring those progressives who think, gee, man, hey, he's a high-octane conservative, is if any of that sounded familiar to you, it's maybe because it's this exact thing that Al Gore has been for for about 30 years. Al Gore has always been, for what I've just described, a carbon tax that's revenue neutral and border adjustable. And it gives me hope that we could bring America together and lead the world to a solution. Border, when I, when I, let me unpack those two things and then hand it over to Ryan again. The revenue neutrality means you put a price on carbon dioxide. Let's say it's $25 a ton. Let's say it's applied upstream at the mine, at the pipeline. There are only 2,000 companies that put stuff in a pipeline or that mine coal. Very small job for the IRS. They could certainly do it in a room this size. So you've just taxed carbon dioxide at $25 a ton. 
makes the price of electricity go up by $11 per average household per month. It makes the price of gasoline go up by 21 cents a gallon. That's the bad news. But then we take that revenue and we either dividend it all back to you in the form of a dividend check like the Alaska Permanent Fund check, or we cut payroll taxes, which is my idea, or really not mine, it was actually Al Gore's idea, um, to cut payroll taxes because if you're concerned about the regressive impact of a carbon tax, and a carbon tax does hit poor people harder than it hits wealthy people, if you untax payroll, the bottom 70 percentile do better under that new system than they do under the current system, says the Congressional Budget Office. So it's revenue neutral. We're going to do a tax, but we're going to cut taxes somewhere else, so we're going to dividend all the money back. And then the final thing is, it's border adjustable, which means you apply the tax on entry of goods from countries that don't have the same price on carbon dioxide. The result would be a lawsuit by China and the World Trade Organization saying that that is an impermissible tariff. We think they lose based on precedence in the chemical industry. Now, I'm not sounding like a scientist or an economist. I sound like a trade lawyer. I'm a commercial real estate lawyer. But we think they lose based on precedence in the chemical industry. After they lose, within 24 hours, because they have an amazing way of reaching consensus in China, we think that they would have the same price on carbon dioxide. Why? Because they're paying on entry through the port of Seattle, let's say, a tax that's, going, that's being remitted to Washington, D.C. After they lose in the WTO, 24 hours later, they've got the same price on carbon dioxide internal to China so that the tax money ends up in Beijing and the goods come through the port of Seattle with no adjustment. So then 24 hours later, with no international agreement, no long negotiations at the UN, just a bold move by the United States, the whole world is following our lead. And that's very exciting, because then you've got seven billion people demanding innovation, not just the 325 million Americans, but seven billion people looking for low carbon alternatives. And that's where the innovation comes from that sparks that innovation similar to what happened in tech. Is that what happened in energy, we believe. So let me hand it back over to Brian, then we get to your questions. CO2 goes into the air, a great portion of it goes into the water. CO2 and water, H2O plus uh, uh, CO2 forms carbonic acid. Carbonic acid takes up the minerals that are in the water and shelled organisms, including oysters back out on the coast where I represent, uh, don't have enough minerals to make their, make their shells. But for those of you who care about salmon, salmon, at the, some, many salmon, at small, when they're very small, eat a thing called pteropods, which is a zooplankton covered with with a, 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 a calcium-based shell, but that pteropod doesn't have enough minerals in the, in the water train because of carbonic acid. It can't make its shell. It can't survive. Salmon can't eat. Salmon die. So if you like fishing, we need to talk to people who may otherwise be skeptics. If you care about salmon as our cultural resource, as an economic resource, as a recreational uh, pastime, then you need to care about ocean acidification. And, and I, with Bob's help, wrote that bill in the Congress, and it's the law that guides most uh, federal research on ocean acidification today. I want to put Bob's comments and his passion for this in the context of our state of Washington. And I don't want to necessarily get too political, but you kind of can't, almost, because we've got an initiative before the state. It may not be perfect. I don't know what is perfect. I know inaction is imperfect. And people, you'll read articles in all the papers justifiably saying, what is the carbon fee initiative going to cost? And Bob gave some possible figures, and people say, I don't want to pay 11 bucks more a month for whatever. But what's very harder to quantify is, what's it going to cost if we don't do this? 
What are the costs of not having a system that in some way prices carbon or otherwise incentivizes innovation? That cost is huge. We lose technological advantage to other countries that are seriously working on this. They're working on battery technologies. They're working on solar technologies. They're developing uh, uh, tidal energy. We lose technological advantage, which has been our strong suit for years. So if we don't do anything, that's a cost. If we don't do anything and sea level rises, which by the way, people get in this debate and say, oh, climate's been changing forever, blah, blah, blah. Or they get worried about whether it's going to be one degree centigrade, two degrees centigrade, et cetera. Let's make it simple that everybody can understand. What's the difference between 31.9 degrees Fahrenheit and 32.1 degrees Fahrenheit? Ice versus water. Snow versus rain. Reliable irrigation versus flooding in the spring. A tiny, tiny degree of temperature change. I ski up at Stevens Pass. Oftentimes I'm up at Stevens Pass and the snow line is about 100 feet above the base of Stevens Pass. Raise that snow level a little bit, we don't have skiing. That's the tiniest worry is that I can't recreate as I want. But when you don't have water to irrigate your crops or feed your livestock, when salmon don't have water to flush them down the river, when the water from the melting glacier raises the sea level, and by the way, I want to step back for a second. Bob pointed this out uh, earlier. This is not unsettled science. We've known for a hundred years, a hundred years, that if you put CO2 in air and shine sunlight through it, it will reflect, the temp uh, reflect the, the infrared light coming back and that'll heat up faster than without, with a lower CO2 content. We've known for a hundred years that if you put CO2 in water, it makes the water more acidic. We're putting billions of tons of CO2 into the air and then you would ask, well, does the expected laboratory result apply in the real world? Have we seen an increase in temperature? Bob pointed it out. There's abundant evidence of that. Have we seen an increase in ocean acidification? Abundance of evidence of that. Is it harmful? Yes. So the, the evidence is really there. And what Bob does so beautifully is he talks to people who might feel threatened by accepting that validity of that evidence and say, you don't have to fight about whether the evidence is real. Let's agree on a solution. Let's find a common sense solution that makes sense, grows our economy, saves the environment, and, and helps us lead uh, in terms of national security and, and technological advancement. That's what Bob's about, that's what I've been trying to be about. But a key issue there is, quite frankly, we don't have enough people in the Congress to make this happen. Bob and I were asked by a radio reporter today, uh, do you think you can make this happen in the current makeup of the U.S. House? No. You just, we don't have the votes. When we, when we switched majority to, I don't know if I ever told you this, we got back to majority after a while and there was a debate happening. And I discovered from the debate, I'd been in the minority my whole time in Congress and we now actually had a brief advantage, all too brief in my judgment, but we, we, not that we didn't deserve some of the whooping we got, but uh, this debate's going on, the guys on Bob's side are just palavering and talking and talking and I thought, I just discovered the four sweetest words in the English language. They are not, I love you, honey. They are, we have the votes. <laughs> if you have the votes and you care about climate, you can do all kinds of good stuff. Now, those votes don't have to come from one party or the other. There's no reason on God's green earth that they have to come from one party or the other. If you're a person of faith, climate should matter. If you're a pro-business person who wants to see our economy thrive, climate should matter. If you're an environmentalist who cares about species and, and the health of the planet, climate should matter. And what Bob and I, through our friendship and our service on the science committee, have tried to do that together. So with that, let's, Bob and I, you want to join me, Bob, and we'll, we'll take any questions. Great. Yeah, I'm out. I'm out here. You go ahead, you keep this because I'm not oh, going to be okay. speaking. So we have about uh, 20 minutes or a little more for Q&A. Let me start us off. Um, you made a very powerful case for uh, p the policies you're proposing. Uh, what you didn't talk about is the politics. Uh -huh. So if, if the carbon fee goes down in Washington, it's going to be because billion, uh, millions of dollars was spent by oil companies against that. Mm -hmm. So oil companies, the coke industries, their network are very powerful forces in our politics. And there's also uh, there's tribal-like politics going on right now, and this has become associated as a democratic issue. So conservatives, Republicans are very much queasy about getting on board. So how do you overcome those political problems? Yeah. 
it's, it's the most important thing is what's going to happen, not in the, not in the houses of Congress uh, between now and the end of the year. It's going to be what happens at Thanksgiving dinner with you. If you can talk with your relations at Thanksgiving dinner, it might begin to develop a constituency for action, particularly on the right. There are plenty of people on the left ready to act on climate. Um, on the right is where our challenge is. And so what we've got to do is we've got to develop that constituency on the right because politicians typically follow, they don't lead. And so we've got to uh, develop a visible constituency on the right for action on climate change. Um, we think that can be done. If you talk about, if you, if you conduct the conversation in conservative, not in progressive. If you talk progressive, it's basically, we need to repent and do with less, let's walk and eat bugs. Um, you know, actually, it's not that, but that's the caricature that uh, conservatives draw of progressives, right? But if you're going to talk to Uncle Charlie coming for Thanksgiving, and he's a conservative, you need to talk about abundance, more energy, more mobility, more freedom, especially distributed energy systems, and the exciting opportunities there. So that's what it takes. And so, so um, is, uh, Brian's right in what he said. We, I don't expect action in this Congress. I don't expect action in the next Congress, regardless of who takes control. If Democrats were to take control of the House, I would not expect much climate action. Perhaps some increased spending on ARPA-E like we were just, uh, I was just talking about. Maybe they'd do that. And we would welcome that at republicen.org. That would be a big help. But as to a carbon pricing scheme from Democrats, well, cap and trade is a cautionary tale. Pass the House and a lot of those folks lost. Brian can talk, speak to that. So I don't expect that to happen. But what we've got to do is we've got to have Republicans joining with, with Democrats in the next Congress to start this conversation about how would we do this in a bipartisan way that could work for both of us. Because the goal has to be that this is bipartisan. Because every piece of major environmental legislation in this country has been passed with bipartisan votes. And Obamacare is a, uh, is a precautionary tale about what happens when you do it all on one side of the aisle. The pendulum swings and it's undone. So like Australia did a carbon tax, they undid it. They did it, they undid it. That's really hard to do innovation when you're swinging like this on the carbon tax. And the consequences are now so close to us on climate that we've got to take a shot that works. We don't have time to flub it up with, I mean, we're seeing the whites of its eyes now. And so you gotta, you gotta make this shot work. It can't be like Australia going this way and that way. And so it's gotta be bipartisan. It's gonna take Republicans, um, but the Republicans that are most important are not the ones with voting cards in their pockets. It is Charlie coming to Thanksgiving dinner. He is the most important person on the planet if he is a conservative, if you can get him to care about climate change. Because that delta, that change between Charlie listening to Rush Limbaugh, dismissing it as a joke, and Charlie deciding to get engaged and talk to Kathy McMorris Rogers is the difference between us winning and losing and us acting on climate or not. It's that important to to change Charlie's mind. Okay. Yeah, the other thing I think we have to do is, is exactly what Bob said, but also tell success stories. Bob and I were just over in Seattle yesterday and we met with a group, and you all in this group room probably are well aware of the conflicts that often happen between ag and fisheries, and sometimes between tribal interests. Bob and I met yesterday afternoon with a group comprised of, believe this or not, the Tulalip tribe, which has got a great fish hatchery program uh, that they run to restore salmon runs. And they are working with one of the largest chicken operations in the state of Washington, which produces prodigious quantities of waste, of, of chicken manure. And they're working to try to find ways to keep the chicken manure out of the streams and rivers, and also then use that manure to produce methane, to produce usable methane, 
So they're going to reduce it because methane, as some of you know, is a, is a, a very serious greenhouse gas. So they're going to try to take a pro what used to be a problem and turn it into a net plus for everybody. Instead of saying, you're ag, we're tribes, we're fish, you're ag, how can we work together? And that's a build, uh, they've built that through mutual trust, mutual respect, and a sense of co commonality and problem solving versus denial, regulation, argument, litigation. And if we tell those stories of how people can come together and actually in a win, 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 win situation, win for the farmers, win for the tribes, win for the salmon, win economically, win for climate, that's a good story to tell. If we just talk gloom and doom, we're not going to get there. And if we just talk one party versus the other party, we're not going to get there. Well, it's a, a, I see it as a combination of multiple things. Personal behavior change, because we could, with modest and not sacrificing behavior changes, we could cut our, all of us could cut our carbon footprint by 20%. When, when, when we talk about the, the relatively small increase that would go on a gallon of gas, gallon of gas is 330, something like that, or west side, I don't know what it is right here. But let's say you add 10%. If you cut 20% of your energy cut consumption by carpooling once a week, that vastly exceeds the cost increase of the carbon tax. And yet from a climate perspective, so we change our behavior. Not in a, and by the way, there's this whole sense of, I'm an American, God dang it, why should I have to change my behavior? In, in World War II, Roosevelt didn't come to America and say, Americans, we're going to fight an existential threat against fascism. But don't worry, we will not inconvenience you at all. You won't have to have gas rationing. You won't have to make any sacrifices. There will be no increased revenue. We'll just send the soldiers over there, do their business, and we'll all get by just fine. No, it was an existential threat to humanity. And it was all on the line, and the American people responded. So A, we've got to say, even if it is a little bit of a behavior change, so, what was the word you used? Flubbing what? <laughs> Nice to have a Christian evangelical <laughs> to keep me in line. I'd use a different word. Uh, secondly, we should, we should throw huge amounts of resources into the technological basic research. If you ever want to have fun, go to the annual ARPA-E conference in DC. You will see amazing ideas. Some of them are ridiculous, but astonishing things about distributed energy, how working on photosynthetic ways to separate hydrogen out, to use that with fuel cells, to put mini generators in individual houses which is resilient, which is national security, which is economically right. So second is technology. Third is tax and regulation pricing. You package that and we've got a shot. And then when you work with timber and with ag and fisheries and businesses, this can be done. It can't be done if people deny it. It can't be done if people demagogue it. It can't be done if people don't think we have to make changes. Yeah, we're counting on China to be interested, and here's the thing. Um, 
just as the Cuyahoga River catching on fire caused America to be concerned about water quality, um, I think it may be that China uh, might, we're, we're at some risk that China may lead us to action on climate change because they are feeling it in their eyes and in their throats, not CO2. You don't feel CO2 in your eyes and your throat, but you feel the proxies for it, the small particulates, the stuff that burned with the, and created, it came out with the CO2. And so I was once on, at the Milken Institute on a panel um, with a guy from the Brookings Institution, a, a, a Chinese professor, who I hope to goodness is a highly placed spy because um, it was a really interesting exchange. And Andy Revkin, formerly of the New York Times, asked me to describe what I've described to you here, and I did. And then he went to the Chinese professor to ask him something, but the Chinese professor ignored his question and said, I, I want to go back to what that guy Inglis was saying. Because I'm telling you, what he just said is the way to do this. So I'm hoping that that Chinese, uh, that Chinese professor is actually very close to President Xi, and he's like this, you know, and he's saying to Xi, we can do this together. Americans are ready to act. We can do it too. We can get it. So I'm counting on the Chinese to actually have a felt need to do something. And they need stability, they need economic growth. Those are values that they hold dear, right? And so th this, this could be the way that they could do it. I think it does trim their competitive advantage somewhat in mass manufacturing. And so one time at UT Austin, there was a Chinese national who was getting his PhD in econ economics. And I said to him, have I got a dissertation topic for you? Uh, you know, does it trim the competitive advantage too much? if you're into mass manufacturing. But um, his initial reaction was no, he thought it's doable. And so, um, but a lot of work needs to be done, obviously, to get China to the place of comfort with this. We don't want to be opposed to China on this. Uh, yeah, right. We want to be, we want everybody to realize we are literally in this together. Um, and so, um, I, I think there's a real opportunity here for that, uh, for a win-win. Um, and. Um, as to the carbon tax, if I could just follow up, it is, it's, if there's consensus in the scientific community about climate change, and there is, there's even greater consensus among economists. I once asked a senior economist at Virginia Tech, I said, give me the name of an economist who would be opposed to what I was describing to you earlier, the internalization of negative externalities. And he sat back in his chair and he thought, and he thought, and he thought, and he said, there isn't one. <laughs> he said, you can't be an economist if, you're, if you don't like the idea of internalizing negative externalities. He said, it'd be like being a scientist and not believing in the scientific method. He said, it just doesn't exist. You can't be an economist um, if, you, if you don't buy that idea. And so the, 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 what the economists would tell us is that this is the, power, this is the way to unleash the power of free enterprise. What, what, explain what you mean by internalization of externalities. It's basically, if I'm English coal-fired electricity, I get away with socializing my soot. Now, conservatives among us, we don't like socializing anything, right? Socialized medicine, we don't like socialized soot, we don't like socialized anything. Okay, so I get away with socializing my soot. I just put it up in the air. Um, some of it lands in my neighbor's lungs. Most of them cough it up and move along. Some of them end up in the hospital. Stinks for them. Um, great deal for me, though, because I'm not accountable. And um, nobody has picked up on the fact that I'm English coal-fired electricity, and all these people get in hospital admissions, causing your Blue Cross and Blue Shield insurance to go up if they're covered by Blue Cross and Blue Shield, causing Medicare expense to go up, Medicaid expense to go up. But I'm not responsible for that. It is a great deal for me. Stinks for my neighbor, stinks for you, because I'm charging all this to your healthcare system. At some point, we're going to have conservatives saying to me, conservative members of Congress, Inglis, you be accountable. Show in your product the price that you're exacting on society. And I'm going to be heard to complain, oh, no, terrible idea, Mr. Congressman. <laughs> um, that's going to make me put on all these new scrubbers. I'm going to have to do carbon capture and sequestration. Do you realize that that's going to make 
I'm going to cost my electricity to go up because I'm going to put all those capital costs in my rate base and I'm going to pass it on to your constituents and they're going to be powerfully mad at you. Um, but someday a conservative member of Congress is saying, Anglis, we are already paying the full cost of your supposedly cheap coal-fired electricity. We're paying in health care and we're paying in, paying in climate damages. Yeah. So how about be even biblically accountable, Inglis, and hold on your property, your own soot, and your own CO2, and be accountable. Because you can't do on your property something that harms your neighbor's property or person. Be biblically accountable, Inglis. And so when that's internalizing negative externalities. And then when I charge you the true cost of my electrons coming to your house, the thing that you probably do is call up a solar hot water heater installer if you're in a place like I live in South Carolina and you say one third of my power is going to heat and water. I think I'll put one of these units like they've got all over the Middle East. Brian and I travel a lot and the Middle East, every roof has a solar hot water heater. A lot of China too. Um, why not do that in South Carolina? Well, reason doesn't make any sense to do it right now because coal-fired electricity is so cheap that you can't go into that business selling me a solar hot water heater for my roof. But you change the economics and you make me, English coal-fired electricity, responsible. And all kinds of businesses spring up like that. Probably solar cells, probably better batteries in my garage, running my volt on sunshine. Really, you can see the revolution that then takes place. And that all starts with fixing the economics. And then the, the environment, we think, takes care of itself uh, because of the liberty and the light and self-interest. Those are all very conservative concepts, but like I say, Al Gore, if he were here, would say, that's all right. Uh, so would Milton Friedman. Oh, yeah, Milton Friedman <laughs> would, would. We had an event at the University of Chicago called, what would Milton Friedman do about climate change? And, I don't know uh, if everybody knows who Milton Friedman was. Maybe give a quick. So it's Ronald Reagan, one of his advisors, economics advisors, a doctrinaire, um, a free enterprise, free market guy, libertarians especially love him. Everywhere I go when I speak to students for liberty, they know exactly the clip I'm going to show them uh, because they've seen it over and over. Because he's, uh, libertarians and conservatives really sort of bow at the mention of Milton Friedman's name. You know, he's one of our patron saints along with Ronald Reagan. Um, so we, we bow when we mention his name. Um, well, I agree with him. Uh, the Lord will provide. You know, I, I just was uh, I've just been corresponding with our dear friend Peter Harris, who runs Arasha. Uh, it's a uh, he's an Anglican priest who the bishop finally <laughs> was on to the fact that Peter was out bird watching too much, and so he said, Peter, why don't you go do what your heart really wants to do? So Peter started this thing called Arasha, and it's this Christian ministry about uh, the environment. Um, and um, it's successful everywhere but America. America is where he has trouble, but everywhere else it's wildly successful. And you've probably never heard of it because you're Americans. Uh, we're Americans. And so, but Peter was recently asked this question. He said, God will take care of us. And uh, um, it's just that he expects us to be responsible stewards. And so it's completely consistent with the biblical ethic to say, God is sovereign, and he will determine the longevity of the earth. I believe that very firmly, and I would agree with my friend Jim Inhofe, U.S. Senator Jim Inhofe. Jim's right. It's arrogant of humankind to say that we can, affect, we, we can determine that. God will determine it. But it's also true, and I think my friend Jim Inhofe would agree, that humans are responsible. You cannot reconcile those two things. You just hold them in tension. And so... The human thing to do is to rise to that responsibility of creation care and say, I'm going to take care, I'm going to steward this creation. And so deer hunting is a great example. You want to steward that population. we got too many of them on Hilton Head, I will tell you. Too many of them. Somebody needs to get hunting on Hilton Head for deer. Okay, they're overrunning the place, right? Um, and so you steward the population of deer. Shoot some of them. Eat them. Um, and uh, keep the population in control uh, since we lost natural predators of deer, I suppose. Um, you want to add something to that? 
Yeah, and one of the things I love about Bob is, and we've come from much different traditions and political and regional, et cetera, but Bob is able to talk to people and listen to people in their own language. And we tend oftentimes on the progressive side, and Bob educated me about this, one big argument has often been, well, 97% of scientists say that climate change is real. To a significant subset of our population, that message translates as follows. The same people who told you that the Bible is false and evolution is, tr is, is real, who've insulted your belief in God, now are telling you to believe that God can't stop climate change. That's not going to be an effective approach. It's effective for your clan or your tribe or your belief system, your epistemology, but it's not effective for them. So Bob finds ways to say, look, don't we agree? This was Scott Tony, uh, Doni, right? Uh, uh, whether you want to have a scientific perspective or a religious perspective, we've got this incredibly beautiful and fragile planet that we're all stewards of. So let's set aside the theological argument, the scientific argument, and not try to win that, and instead say, what can we agree on? Can we agree that clean air is good for everybody? Can we agree that we want to not destroy this magnificent planet? And, and then can, you know, that's, that's, I think, we sort of put our ideological guns down and do respectful curiosity. And then we start finding the common ground. And, and we, we haven't done that enough. We've been too about fear. We've been too about we're right, you're wrong on both sides a little bit. I think I don't in any way, shape, or form say there's a, a, an equivalency to the two parties on this issue. There is not currently. I'd like to see there become one. But, but we, we at the same time, those of us who are concerned about climate need to learn how to talk and listen and find ways to communicate and find that shared value, like the, the, the tribe and the chicken rancher. Yeah, I mean, let me just add something, if I may. Uh, Brian's doing all the complimenting to me. Let me just say, this is a guy who grew up hunting. This is, the caricatures we draw of the other side are just really caricatures and they're false. I mean, this is a guy who grew up hunting. He, he knows about these things. He's not, um, and I, I told Brian earlier today, if the people of the fourth district could hear Brian speaking about uh, some of these issues about uh, using burned over forests, for example, and uh, saving the wood. Wow, they'd be very reassured that even somebody from, say, Seattle, isn't that one of those communist places, uh, <laughs> would, um, is an okay guy. You know, they would, they would be reassured that, yeah, we can, we can get on in America with somebody from Seattle or near Seattle. And so, lives in Seattle now. But, uh, so really, we've got to stop drawing the caricatures and, and not insist on, on adherence to whatever it is that our thing is. And just if you're somebody who is big into evolution, let me just make the case here. Please don't try to tell somebody that they're dumb if they don't agree with you about evolution. There is no need for them to come con be converted to your view of godless evolution in order to act on climate. Absolutely no need for you to try to convert them. But I will tell you, there are a lot of, of, of evolution evangelists out there. They say we're gonna sing all 16 verses of we just evolved, the buses will wait, you come down front and you agree with us, we all evolved, and you must do that in order to join, join this church to act on climate change. And just examine that and think about whether that's true. And it is true. And the result is your Uncle Charlie, if you're a progressive, your Uncle Charlie has to, has to be a person of faith. Do you realize how offensive that is to Charlie? You don't need to change his mind on that. You can just say to Charlie, Charlie, we love you. And in your system, in your view, isn't it right that you should be a steward? Then you're talking his language rather than trying to convert him to your worldview. Um, so, yeah. Okay, all right, one last question in the back there. Yeah. I think you just have to admit that their jobs are in fact threatened. And we're gonna take care of you. We're gonna buy out your pensions we're going to give you re relocation assistance, and we're going to use job retraining because your coal industry is going under the bus. I think you just got to tell them straight out, and you don't tell them. 
here in West Virginia, oh, you can become a solar installer. That's great. It's about $18 an hour as opposed to, say, $40, $45 an hour. Try to support a family on that 18 if you've been used to living on 40 or 45. It's going to be hard in coal country. And I'll tell you, I've been to Kentucky. I've been to West Virginia. I've been in Wyoming. I've been in Montana. And we've had this conversation. And I just say, learn from us in South Carolina. Textiles went under the bus in South Carolina. When I first went to Congress in 92, it was before the internet and the PC, the idea was we could go up there and lock arms with the Alabamans and the Mississippians and the North Carolinians, and we could, by golly, keep out those Chinese imports. And if you're going to make this, this shirt in Costa Rica, that's sort of OK with us, but the fabric is, by golly, going to be American. That was the marching orders from the textile industry, right? And we went to Washington to do that. And you could almost see it being possible in 1992. But then along the way, the internet and the PC created this opportunity for the marriage of labor and capital to occur out in space somewhere. And so the American people got a taste of cheaper clothes. <coughs> and they said, hey, we like it. And that textile industry went boom, <laughs> under the bus. But in South Carolina, we had a very forward-thinking governor, probably the best in my lifetime, named Carol Campbell dead now of, uh, of Alzheimer's. But Carol personally recruited BMW. A lot of times politicians claim credit for recruiting somebody. No, no, he personally recruited BMW to Spartanburg, South Carolina. They have $7 billion on the ground in Spartanburg right now. They've got 6,000 workers, 6,000 employees, about 20,000 supplier jobs. They literally replaced the textile industry. And so what I said in West Virginia, for example, to West Virginia <coughs> Boys State, and it's just some resistance. But afterwards, a, a small cadre of boys came up, and I said, someday you're going to be the actual governor of this state. And you've got to be like Carol Campbell. Find a BMW to come to West Virginia. West Virginia is a beautiful place. Mountains and wilderness and rivers, as long as you don't destroy them with mountaintop removal, <laughs> come with a BMW. <coughs> Figure out it won't be BMW, it'll be something else. And replace those jobs. But don't, don't, don't try to tell a coal miner that they're going to be, that somehow they're going to get a nice solar job. It's going to have to be something that replaces at that level. And it's going to be hard. Um, and in the meantime, we've got to buy out the pensions because the companies are going to go broke. And those people aren't going to have any pensions to rely on. So that's going to be a use of the carbon tax revenue. We're for revenue neutrality, but I just gave that away. I'll, I'll trade that, and I'll trade it for job retraining, and I'll trade it for work for relocation assistance. Small money in, in the grand scheme of things. OK, I'm afraid our time is up. Let me encourage you again to, uh, to stop at the table out there and, and, uh, and take the survey, or at least get the information. You can take the survey later. Well, I want to thank all of you for coming out today. Now join me in thanking our guests for a really informative conversation. And now you know what to talk about at Thanksgiving. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks so much. That was great.